Well, good morning, and welcome to Corinth Christian Church Online. My name is Josh, one of the ministers here on staff, and I want to be the first to say welcome. Thank you for joining us today here online for our church service. We're glad you're with us. And if you are new, first or second or third time, newer with us, we want to point your attention to a resource we made just for you, Corinth.cc. There you'll find all sorts of resources to follow along with today's service. And you can also click the I'm New tab and just check in. It takes about 10 seconds to fill out that form and, and we'll send you a gift card in the mail. Just our small way of saying thanks for joining us today. And you, you made it on a good day today. We're right smack dab in the middle of this series talking about our rhythms. And sometimes we need to reset our, our rhythms. Today is all about community and relationships. And, you know, you're 50% less likely to die this next year if you are part of a healthy, supportive community. It's, it's so powerful and important, and we hope you'll be a part of one. And so we want to just encourage you along that theme today as we preach through this series. We're also going to sing some songs together. We'll take communion together. So in a digital way, in a virtual way, we're part of the same community. But the challenge is still there, that when you're, when you're ready, if nothing else is holding you back, no pre-existing conditions or anything like that, health concerns, we want to invite you. We're here in person. So please come on out and be a part of a healthy community. We're going to have a great day together. And once again, we're glad you're with us. If you're ready to jump in, we're ready to jump in. Let's worship together. Good morning. Welcome to Holy Christian. Let's stand together this morning. Let's sing our praise. We want to give this holy King Jesus.
Thanks for singing with us this morning. You may be seated. Good morning, Corinth. Y'all are a good looking crew. Well, most of you. Anyways, my name is Michael. I am the children's minister here on staff. Makes sense, right? I want to welcome you to Corinth, whether you are with us in the room or you are joining us online. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. If you are a guest in the room with us, I want to say welcome to you. We would love for you to take out your phone, go to your, your web browser, scroll down, or go to uh, corinth.cc, scroll down to the icon that says I'm new, fill that out, or an easier way is there's a card in the seat backs in front of you that has a QR image. You can scan that with your phone. That'll take you directly to the I'm new page at corinth.cc. Fill that out so we get to know you a little bit more. At the end of service, we would love to meet you. You can do that by going out the double doors. There's a TV kiosk right across the way that says Let's Connect. We would love to, to, to meet you, socially distance, of course, to say thank you so much for being a part of our worship today. We have a great hour of worship in store today. We'll be singing some songs together. We'll be taking communion together. And then Adam, our senior minister, he's going to be coming today to preach the second sermon in a series titled Reset. Today he's going to be talking about relationships and how relationships are so important in our lives. So it's going to be a fantastic day of worship today. Glad you're with us this morning. Now tomorrow is a day that we remember the Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr. He was a man that gave his life for a cause. Upstairs in our kids' church, we're also remembering another man today who gave his life. We're remember, remembering Stephen from Acts chapter 6 and 7, who gave everything, first martyr for Jesus. Every single week that we gather in here, we remember Jesus in the ultimate cause, him coming to earth. And that's who we are going to praise him for today, that he came to earth and he died for us and he rose again. So I'm going to pray and we're going to continue with our service today. God, we love you. We're thankful for today. God, as we worship you today, may we worship you in the spirit and in truth. We ask these things in your name. Amen. This Sunday is uh, one of our favorite Sundays of the whole year. Um, on this Sunday, usually the second or the third Sunday in January, uh, we will look back and see all the decisions that were made, the baptisms that we had from the year previous. So uh, we invite you today uh, to sit back to celebrate with us and enjoy as we look back at the baptisms we had from last year.
so much for the work that you uh, were doing in 2020. Jesus, in a, a year where it was easy for us to question where you were, what you were up to, uh, it's great to look back and see that you've been doing amazing things in people's lives. You, as you have been for years and years and years, have been drawing people to yourself. And Jesus, we uh, were humbled when we think that uh, we were somehow a part of your work last year in 2020 and, and these decisions that were made for you. Jesus, we, uh, we come now to this time of communion. We want to remember your sacrifice for us, your resurrection, your death. And so we ask that you direct our hearts that they'd be fully on you. We love you, our King, our miracle worker. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. I can't think of a better way to follow up that video than for us to take communion together. In the previous church that we served at, it was a smaller country church, and every so often they would have a covered dish meal after the service. And after a few weeks of us being on staff, they had another one of these meals, and nobody really knew us, so everybody wanted to find out our story. They talked to us until everything was cleaned up, and they had gotten everything ready and pretty much ran us out for the afternoon. So we, were, we still lived about 40 minutes away from the church at that time. So we had a long ride home. I was tired. And so we almost got home, and I realized, I don't think I have my cell phone. So I lose my cell phone, my keys, my wallet a lot. Just don't tell Kristen that I admitted that. But I think they actually made the Find My Phone app for me. Apple did that. And so we pulled over. We opened up the app, and we saw that my phone was in the field across from the church. I said, oh, no. And so if it had been inside the church, we probably would have just left it till the next day. But since it was outside, we probably figured we should go get it. So we drove all the way back to the church. And when I refreshed the app and we got back to the church, I saw that it was sitting right over where the church's dumpster was. And I thought for a second, man, I could really use a new phone. But the cheap side of me won out took off my outer shirt, I jumped in the dumpster, and I started ripping open bags of just nasty trash. After about five or six bags, I kind of reflected and thought, man, I was tired today. I drove all the way home, came all the way back, and now I'm in this nasty dumpster ripping open trash bags, all for a phone. And th so I thought I'll rip open one or two more and I'll be done. So the next one I opened, I heard the chime from the find my phone alert. So I dug down, digging through nasty casseroles and chicken bones to the bottom where there's a, a wrapped up tablecloth, plastic tablecloth. I opened up the tablecloth and I found my phone. 
Y'all, I was so happy. It was like I found a hidden treasure. Jumped out of the dumpster I showed Crystal, and I was so excited. All for a phone. 2,000 plus years ago, Jesus stepped out of heaven. He came into this dumpster of what we know as earth. Lived a perfect life for you and for me. Sought us as his treasure. He died and was raised again, defeating death for you and for me. And we remember that right now at communion. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, But God, so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that while we were dead, he made us alive in him. So today at communion, we take our bread to which Jesus said, This is my body. Take and eat. He took the cup. He said, this is the cup of my new covenant. Take and drink. God, we love you. We thank you for sending Jesus into our world to become like us, to die for us. May we remember him today. We love you so much and ask these things in your name. Amen.
God, today that is where we find ourselves, uh, coming to you, seeking your arms that are wide open, seeking uh, forgiveness, celebrating the forgiveness that we have in Christ Jesus, celebrating the fact that uh, you drew near to us even whenever we were so far away, celebrating the fact that uh, we have been made whole, we've been made new, we've been cleaned because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and Father, today as, as we seek you, we seek you, some of us today, with, with heavy hearts, uh, hearts that are, that are heavy for, for friends, for family who are uh, battling, who are struggling with, with illnesses, who are struggling with uh, just recovering from, from illnesses. And so today, God, we're asking that your healing power would invade, that your, your breath would be uh, breathe upon us and that we would experience your release, that we would experience your healing today. And Father, for those who come in today, not in the grip of a virus, but in the grip of, of fear, we've been crippled and imprisoned and we've stopped living out of a fear for, for dying. Today, would you breathe your life into our lungs and may we breathe deeply and remember who we are and who we have been called to be and we would we go out and would we live life to the fullest through the power of Jesus and so Holy Spirit today we are asking for you to to move we are asking for you to uh, mess with us we are asking for you to uh, comfort us we are asking you to speak directly into our hearts into our souls um, would you please, Spirit, give us eyes to see where you are leading, where you are directing. Would you give us ears to hear your powerful words today through scriptures? And so, Jesus, we now, in your presence, we ask you to speak to us today. And so we ask all of this in your holy name. And the church says today, amen and amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam. It's good to have you all here with us in the room. Good to have you tuned in online with us as well. Um, if you're on Facebook, YouTube, Church Online, thank you so much uh, for joining us. In fact, why don't you jump into the comments right now and uh, let us know who is watching and uh, who you're watching with. It is also a great time for you to like and share and invite some folks to uh, join along and uh, watch with you today as well. In fact, if you're in the room today, can you do me a favor? Let's say hello to our online friends. Let's give them a howdy on the count of three. You guys ready? One, two, three. Howdy! And so uh, it is good to have you tuned in. If it's the very first time you've tuned in, please be sure to head on over to Corinth.cc and uh, click that I'm New card and fill that out. If it is your first time with us in the room, we want to say welcome and thank you so much uh, for coming in. And if you haven't scanned that QR code, please do that as well. We would love a chance uh, to connect with you. And thank you to all of you online and in the room who've been giving, whether it's online or in person, so much uh, for your generosity. It has been um, just incredible and encouraging for us to watch. And so thank you for your faithful giving. And how about this? Let's do this real quick. Can we give God just a big hand? 26 baptisms. Here, 26 baptisms. Come on now. Now just stop and think about everywhere we were this year and where we weren't. 
I mean, for like 13, 14, 15 weeks, something like that, we didn't gather in person. You know, we didn't do any of that, but yet we still had 26 people who gave their lives to Christ, who were baptized and united into him. Just further proof that our God is not constrained, that he is still doing a work. He is still promising to do a new thing. And I believe that in 2021, he's going to do a new thing again. Can I get an amen? Come on now. Yes, God's going to do something great. So it is good, good, good to be here. Um, here in just a second, as, as we start our, our message today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to zone out. And uh, some of y'all are experts at zoning out in a sermon. I watch you every week. Okay. And so I'm actually going to give you permission to do that here in just a moment. So stick with me uh, for just a couple more seconds. And I'll tell you what I want you to zone out to, though. I want to try to direct your zoning out. And so um, I, I want to start off with a question. So, Michael, let's go ahead and throw this question up here on the screen. Here's, here's the question we start off with today. Who in your life has had the biggest impact on your faith? Okay, so this is what I want you to start thinking about. Who is it in your life that has had the biggest impact on your faith? Who personally in your own life has had the biggest impact? On your faith. So I want you to start thinking about this. Just let this kind of start rolling around in your head. Just kind of start thinking about this. Who in your life has had the biggest impact on your faith? And while you're thinking about that, let me just give you a few names from, from my life. Okay? And I'll just I'll share a few names of my life. My mom and dad. Big impact on, on my, my faith. Um, I, I like to joke that whenever I was growing up as a kid, I had a drug problem. Uh, because my mom drugged me to church every single time the doors were open. That's funny. Come on now. That's good right there. And so, um, you know, she, she drug us to church. You know, every time the doors were open, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, she, she would make us go. I hated it a lot of the times, honestly. But I'm really glad that she did it. Because it laid a foundation of faith that all the other bricks would end up being built upon. My mom and dad had a huge, huge impact on my, on my faith. I still do. Um, now, part of my story is, like, I stopped going to church. Once mom quit making me go to church, I stopped going. And I didn't go to church from, like, seventh grade till my senior year in high school, which is really funny because then I ended up in youth ministry and doing ministry for kids in seventh grade to high school. And so sometimes they'd be like, you don't know what you're doing. And it's like, yep, guilty, you know, because I was never a part of it. And so, um, but my senior year of high school, the, the youth minister there in Carthage, Missouri, at First Christian Church, his name was uh, Jeff Johnson, um, he took an interest in me, and uh, the phrase that I think we both would use now is he began to spiritually stalk me, okay, um, spiritual stalking. And so it, it was a small town as far as like, you know, um, you know, acreage or mileage, you know, square mileage would go. And so um, he would show up at all my basketball games. He would show up at different events that I was a part of, and he'd always make a, a point to just speak to me. Um, there, there would be times whenever he'd just be driving through town and he'd see me out in the front yard shooting baskets. And, and so he would pull over into my driveway and he'd just rebound, you know, for me for, for an hour or so. And I'd just shoot and he'd rebound and he'd talk to me. And, and Jeff is the one who um, got me interested in faith. He's the one who um, got me um, interested in going to Bible college. It was our Christian college who got me interested in doing ministry. Okay? So Jeff Johnson is another huge, huge impact. On my life and my faith. Um, Gary Zusiak's another name. Um, G Gary Zusiak was a Bible college professor of mine at Ozark Christian College there in Joplin, Missouri. And then um, whenever I went into ministry there at a, at a church in Joplin, um, Gary actually became my mentor and more of like a spiritual father for me. We'd go out for lunch every single week. It was like Mondays or Tuesdays we would go out and we would go eat good barbecue at Red Hot and Blue. It was a restaurant there in Joplin, Missouri. And we would eat and we would talk and he would pay, which was great. And, and, and we would you know do that. But he would talk about you know what it means to be a godly husband, a, to be a godly pastor, to be you know a godly dad. And we would just talk about everything. And he became a spiritual father, one of my spiritual fathers. Still talk to Gary multiple times, multiple times over the course of a year. I, I will call him. Anytime I am in a spot and I don't know what to do, you want to know the first call I make? Gary Zustiak. He's a spiritual father to me. Uh, recently, I've had a couple other guys just kind of come into my life and have just really had a huge impact on my faith. I'm Alan Algram. Um, he's the leader of a, a group I'm a part of. Um, you know, Nick and Shan and Doug and, and Cody and Harrison. These guys are all just pouring themselves into me. I'm pouring myself into them. And it's just had a huge impact on my faith. So let me ask you the question again. Who in your life has had the biggest impact on your faith? Because you, you know what I, I find interesting about you know, all those relationships that I just went through and just telling you about in my life, maybe you look at yours, maybe you'll see the same thing, is 
the way that God just kind of like put them into place. It's like God always put those relationships into place right before I needed them or I even knew that I was going to need them. And there would always be some reason and it would always be something that would take place after those relationships were going on and be like, oh, it's a good thing God had those people in my life. I bet as you look back over your life, you would probably say the same thing. There's just like, man, this person, at like just the right time, they just showed up in my life. Right before I knew I was going to need them, God placed them in my life. Who in your life has had the biggest impact on your faith? Now, if you're, you're zoning out, I want you to come back to me now, okay? So uh, hopefully you've got names and you've got faces in your mind and you've been thinking about this. And, and one of the things that I, that I wish we could do, if we had you know, no time constraints and everybody was comfortable, you know, one of the things we would do is we'd like set up a microphone right here and we'd say, all right, you guys, gonna, everybody's going to have you know, 30 to 60 seconds and you're going to come up in front of this microphone and you're going to just tell everybody who had the biggest impact on your faith. You just got to give their name and maybe just a real quick summary of what it was that they did and and so people would come up and they would just start going and we'd be here and it would be an incredible experience to get to hear about all the people who had such an impact on all of our, our faith. Okay. But let me, let me tell you that if we were to do this little, you know, microphone parade and everybody sharing who had the biggest impact on your faith, can I tell you one thing you would not hear? I can guarantee you, you would not hear is that there would be nobody who would walk up to this microphone and that say, you know what? I would like to thank nobody. Because I did this all on my own. I discovered God on my own. I learned how to grow my faith on my own. And so whenever you ask who had the biggest impact on your faith, it was me. All right? Now, if you're watching online and you think that or you're in the room, let me just tell you, you are wrong. All right? That's not how this works. Okay? Because And we, we we wouldn't hear that. Instead, we would hear things like, well, it was my mom and dad. You know, they took me to church whenever I was a kid, and they kind of taught me what the importance of being a, a follower of Jesus. Or, you know, it was, I was just minding my own business at work, and there was this guy over there, and he started bugging me and badgering me and inviting me to church, and finally I gave in, and I went to church, and then all of a sudden things just kind of changed. Or it was, you know, I was watching her and the way that she handled the loss of her mother and the way that she handled it with dignity and grace and strength, and I was just confused. I, I didn't understand that, and so I asked her, how have you handled this all so well? And she said, well, it's my faith in Jesus. And I said, okay, I'm intrigued now. You're going to have to share more with me. And that's what opened the gates. Or it was, I was in a really bad spot. I was in a rough spot in my life. And then all of a sudden, this person just showed up in my life and they took care of me. And they, they, they just started you know, taking care of me, pastoring me, and just like kind of really loving me when nobody else would love me. And that's what kind of opened up the doors to faith. Nobody would ever say, I did it all on my own. And the reason that nobody would ever say that is because we know this to just be be true. Is that God always uses our relationships to impact our faith. In fact, our our bottom line this morning is, is just simply this. Our relationship with others impacts our relationship with God. The the relationships that you and I, that we have with other people, it impacts our relationship with God. And one of the greatest influences on your life, don't miss this, are the people in your life. God uses relationships to impact and to grow our faith. And as we're in week two of our series called Reset, where we're saying 2020 was a kick in the pants and we like a reset, we like to go back, but we don't want to go back to 2019. We don't want to go back to 2009. We don't want to go back to 1999. We, we actually, whenever we say we want to reset, we want it to go back to the way that God actually intended it to be. And one of the things that if we want to start to move in that direction, one of the things that needs to be reset in our lives are our relationships. So today's title is just that, Reset Your Relationships. We're talking about resetting relationally. And the reason this is so important is that if you can reset your relationships, you can reset your faith. And if you can reset your faith, you can reset your life. God uses other people to impact our faith in him, our relationship with him. And as, as we go to the Bible, we can find all kinds of stories that prove this point. I mean, this is just out there. This is just kind of a theme of the scriptures. It's relationship, relationship, relationship. So that means that I got to pick whichever one that I wanted to out of all of those stories because I'm the one that gets to choose. And so I chose one of my favorite stories. It's in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 2. So if you got a Bible, um, I'd invite you to just grab it and open it up there. And uh, we're going to look at just one of my favorite stories um, in the Bible. It'll be up here on the screen behind me 
as well. So here is what Mark tells us. Mark chapter 2, we're starting off here in verse 1. He says this, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. And they gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by the four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it. Everybody say, digging through it. Digging through it, right? We're talking, we're digging through it right here. That's what he said. They, di- they dug through the roof and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus, say this with me, when Jesus saw their faith, oh man, if there, if there is a phrase that you want to highlight, underline, circle, that might be one of the things here. Well, that just, I love that phrase. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Jump down to verse 11. There's a conversation that goes on, a little bit of a debate. And Jesus looks at the man. He says, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone. And they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. I love this story. I, I, I really, really do. There, there's a lot of stuff that, that are going on here. I mean, so Mark is just kind of done. He's done a great job. He sets the scene. He's like, so Jesus is there in Capernaum. And whenever Jesus shows up, and this is something that Mark just kind of makes clear throughout his entire gospel. Whenever Jesus shows up, so does a crowd. Because whenever Jesus is there, people are like, we want to hear what this guy has to say. We've seen the miracles. We've heard about the miracles. We need to see with our own eyes. We want to hear with our own ears just exactly who this Jesus guy is. And so here they are, and they all gather in this one little house, and it was a packed house. This is a pre-COVID, pre-social distancing house, you know, the kind of thing. And they're just like in there shoulder to shoulder, you know, you know, elbow to elbow. And they're just in there crammed in there. And so Mark tells us that there are these four guys. Now we don't know a lot about these four guys. Okay. Um, but here, here are a couple of things we know. Like we, we don't know, like, how did they become friends with this paralyzed guy? We don't know that. We don't know how long that they knew the paralyzed guy. We don't know that. But what we do know is that they cared enough about this guy, that they had heard enough about Jesus, that they believed that Jesus was the answer to their paralyzed friend's problem, and they believed that if they could just get their friend to Jesus, that Jesus would be able to solve this paralytic's condition. And so they take him, and so they pick him up, and they just take him. They're walking him to the house, and they they get to the house, and then they get there, and they see that people are already spilling out of the door, that there's no room for them in there. And so they're like, oh, no, what are we going to do? Because he needs to see Jesus. And so it says they went up on the roof. Now, that sounds a little weird, but let me put you in a first century house for just a second. They would actually build them out of mud, and then, you know, so they'd be able to escape the heat at night. Uh, They would uh, make basically like an outdoor patio on their roof, and they put ladders up there so people could go up there and, and hang out, which doesn't sound like a bad idea, right? So that's what they would do. And so these, these guys, they, they carry their buddy up on the mat all the way up in the roof. And then, then Mark says they start digging into the roof because their roof isn't made of plywood and shingles. It's made of mud. Now, here's what I find fascinating. Do you think there are actually like shovels and stuff up there on the roof? No, they got down on their hands and knees and started digging through all that mess. Because they wanted their friend to get to Jesus. Now, I don't know what it would have been like to be in the room that day, but I can imagine it would have been a little different. You know, because they're sitting there and they're listening to Jesus and they're talking, and then all of a sudden it's like one clump of mud comes down. They're like, hmm, I wonder what that was, you know? And then another clump of mud falls down. Maybe one hits you and you're like, I'm trying to hear Jesus and this roof is coming in. And then all of a sudden it just goes phoom, just right down and you look up and there's just like this giant hole in there. And then all of a sudden you like see this mat and it says they lowered him and I don't know how they did it with pulleys or what, but I'm just glad it didn't say they dropped him, you know, and it's like just boom. He's like, he's paralyzed already. And so I'm just dropping him down in there. And so um, Jesus can fix that too, right? And so, um, but they like, they lower him down there and it says Jesus saw their faith. And so he heals the guy. Now, now, here's what's interesting. You read through that entire story. You know something that's never said? 
is that Jesus, it never says anything about the paralytic's faith. Isn't that interesting? Never says that the paralyzed guy had faith. Never says that, you know, it was the faith of the guy who was going to be healed that was healed. No, it was the faith of the four friends that Jesus saw. And so he healed that guy. Now, here's a rhetorical question for you. Do you think the paralytic ended up with faith? Absolutely. And so if we could have that microphone moment with him... And, you know, if you were able to sit down, and I don't know if you'd ever be able to sit down and talk with the guy because he's like, no, I've been sitting for too long. I've been laying around for too long. If you want to talk to me, you've got to walk, right? Because this is fun. If you're able to get him to slow down long enough, say, hey, can you tell me who had the biggest impact on your faith? Who in your life has had the biggest impact on your faith? You think his story would go something like this? You know, there I was, just lying around, because that's all I could do. But I had these four friends. And they had heard enough about Jesus that they believed that if they could just get me to Jesus, that that would be the thing that would change my life. And so they picked me up. They walked me all the way there. They even got up on the the roof, man. They got down on their hands and knees, and they dug through that roof so that I could be brought before Jesus. It's like, you want to know who had an impact on my faith? It's those four guys. Those four guys, they stopped at nothing to get their friend to Jesus. Can I, can I get devotional on you for just a second, then we'll jump right back in? Who in your life are you carrying their mat? Who do you have in your life that has a mat that needs to be carried that you could pick up and walk them to Jesus? Here's another question for you. Who do you have in your life that would be willing to carry your mat and would stop at nothing to get you to Jesus. Do you have anybody that would dig a hole in a roof for you? Do you have anybody you would dig a hole in a roof for? See, this paralytic, his life is just absolutely altered and it is changed. And what is it that changes his life? Where does it all begin? Relationships. It's a friendship. It's the the relationship of these four guys who stop at nothing to get him to Jesus. Because our relationships with others impacts our relationship with God. Now, you're watching online. You're here in person. You are the smartest of the smartest. You are the sharpest of the sharp. And so here's one of the things I know already. I have not told you anything brand new today. Every single one of us in this room knows this to be the case. We know that our relationships impact our relationship with God, sometimes in the positive, sometimes in the negative. We, we know this to be true. And we know that we need people and that people need us. We know all of these things. Okay, So knowing is not the issue here. And so what is the, the problem? Well, the problem is very simple. It's this. We were created for relationships, but we drift towards isolation. That's what we do. We we were created for these things. We know this to be true. We know that we need people. We know that people need us. But the problem is, is we just, we tend to drift toward isolation. We just tend to drift towards just being by ourselves. We tend to just get to this place where we don't let people in and we keep people out. And we think that for some reason, that even though we were created for a relationship, that we don't actually need relationship. And so we just isolate ourselves. And that's why, you know, the research starts to to prove this out. I mean, Researchers are finding things out like this, like 45% of adults, okay, adults, not middle school girls, okay, not high school boys, adults, 45% of adults say, I think it's really hard to make new friends. It's really hard. It's difficult. And that's why the average American has not made a new friend in more than five years. Isn't that crazy? It's been five years since some of you all have ever made a new friend, made a new relationship. And then, you know, so we're already finding these things. And then 2020 comes along, and it's like, oh, hey, by the way, um, all of you lonely people who have no friends, you can't make new friends because it's really hard to do that. Um, Don't ever talk to each other again. Um, Don't get near each other. Don't shake anybody's hand. Don't give anybody a hug. Um, Don't do any of those kind of things. Oh, and by the way, at the same time, we're going to become the most politically isolated or, you know, uh, politically extreme on both sides. We're going to become racially divided. We're going to be culturally divided. We're going to become isolated that way. And so we're going to throw all these things into the mix. And so if you're lonely, good luck. And so we feel this, don't we? It's like, God, I know that I need relationships. 
And so we just, we, we, but we just keep drifting further and further and further into isolation. And we just keep drifting further and further and further into loneliness. Is it any surprise that we're the loneliest people that have ever walked the face of the earth? And so what do we do? Well, we jump on social media. It's like, well, surely there I'll find something good and positive that will make me feel better about myself and feel connected to people. Well, that's, how's that working out for us? Yeah. It, did you know that actually the more time you spend on social media, this is, this is like research fact kind of stuff, the lonelier you feel. Lonelier you feel. So we're, we're isolate ourselves. You know, we just keep isolating, isolating. So what are we going to do? We have to fight the drift towards isolation. If that's like the natural thing that we do is we just drift towards it, that means you've got to fight against it. You've got to fight against the drift towards isolation. And so I want to give you just real quick three ways that you can fight the drift towards isolation, all right? Some of these things will sound um, uh, just like, like old stuff to you. Uh, maybe some of it sounds new to you. So if you're taking notes, here's the first thing. If you, if you want to fight the drift towards isolation, you've got to get busy. You've got to get busy. You've got to get busy serving. Okay, you got to find your team to be a part of to where you and a like-minded group of people are oriented towards a similar goal to where you are trying to accomplish something together. Okay? And whether that is here at the church and you find yourself on a part of a serve team, whether that's guest services, working with kids, all the other things that are going on, whether that is out in the community and you're serving at Fish or Shepherd Staff or any of those kind of things, if you're helping out with blood drives, but you've got to find your team and get busy. Because here's the thing. Here's how I got it down to my notes. Sometimes the best way to get through your problems is to focus on serving other people in their problems. Okay? Let me say that again. One of the best ways to work through your problems is to start serving other people in the midst of their problems. You want to fight the drift? Get busy. Start serving. You want to fight the drift? Here's the second thing is get in a group. You, you need a group. You need people. You need friendships in your lives. So you've got to find your group. You've got to find your tribe. And you've got to start meeting consistently. Okay? And I, sometimes I've got to say things that should be obvious. So here, listen up. Everybody listen up. Whenever I say you need to find your group, somebody out there is going, I already have my group. I go drinking with them every Friday night. And we drink till we pass out. Those are my boys. <laughs> no! Okay? No. You've got to find the right group. The right people, people who are going to grow you and stretch you and lead you to a deeper and a more, uh, more fruitful faith. You got to find the right people. And so it, for us, it's small groups, it's Sunday school classes. You know, if it's something you're like, I just want to do something on my own, fine. Find four guys that you can go have coffee with once a month. Find four ladies that you can go out and have lunch with once a month. And then you get together and you actually start doing life together. And ask each other difficult questions. Ask each other, hey, what, what's get bringing you joy right now? What's dragging you down? What are you learning? What are you going to do about it? And you just start growing. you got to have a group. you got to have a group of people who are going to continue to spur you on, who are going to hold you close, who are going to lift you up and call you up and call you out whenever it needs to be done. You need a group. Now, here's the, here's the key. Some of you are like, I want to do this. I've been trying to do this. I've been trying to do this for, for three years to get together with these folks. I just can't do it. Here, here's just a super principle um, that I've recently learned, and I think this might help you. It's helped me. Okay, If you want to get something started, then write a date down in pencil. Pencil. Target a date because here's the deal. If you don't ever write it in pencil, it'll never get written in ink. So you just write that date and say, hey, we've been talking about getting together forever. So here it is, January 27th, 1030 at this place. We're going to get together. It's like, well, I can't do that day. Great. What day can you do? That's how you get things done. Get yourself into a group. So get busy serving, get in a group. And then here, here's the thing, because there's some of you all out there, maybe you're watching online, maybe you're here in the room, and you're like, you know what, Turner, I, I've done what you all have told me forever, and, and I, I've been serving, I've been in a group, and I still feel isolated. I, I don't feel like I have, I, I actually know anybody, I don't feel like it's done anything for my relationships. So here, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just, I'm, I wanna use a velvet hammer, okay? Is that, is, I wanna be, gentle, strong, okay, kind of, kind of thing. Here, here's what I want to just suggest. Maybe the reason why you have yet to connect in the midst of your serving and in your group is because this, you have refused, and this is the last thing, if you want to fight the drift, you have refused to get real. You have left a veneer up. 
And you have kept a wall up. And your default posture has been something that looks like this. You got the stop sign out and you're like, no, 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 I don't want anybody to come, but I do really want somebody to come near to me. But no, 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 you're getting too close. And so the reason why you've never connected, why you don't feel like you have those deep and abiding relationships is because you have refused to get real. You're still hiding all this stuff. You're still holding on to all your secrets. You don't have anybody that you can say, you know what, I have no secrets with them and it is well with my soul. Because here's the truth of life, friends. You are only as sick as your secrets. And the more secrets that you hold on to and the more secrets that you don't have somebody that you can just share with and just kind of unload and bear your soul to. And if you don't have a relationship with people like that, you're just going to feel sick all the time. But you've got to have a group. You've got to have a group of people, four or five people to where you can just say, man, I'm struggling with this. I'm going to be real with you right now. I'm going to be transparent with you right now. And I want to share with you what I am struggling right now. And here's why this is so important. Don't, Don't miss this. So often what happens in groups is we just get together and we just share how successful we've been. But here's the thing. Whenever you only share your successes, you end up as competitors. It's whenever you share your struggles that you actually become brothers and sisters. Whenever you say, man, this isn't going as well as I thought it was going to go. That's that's where abiding relationships come to fruition. See, you need people in your lives, and people need you in their life. We need these relationships, and we need to make sure that we are prioritizing and placing ourselves into the right environments to where God can bring these relationships into our lives, to where he can challenge us and grow us and stretch us and impact our faith. We need this in our lives. Now, for some of you, everything I'm talking about so far sounds easy peasy because you are people people and you wake up in the morning going, who can I have coffee with today? You know, it's just like, I I need to call them, okay? And so for you, you're like, I'm ready to go and here's what I'm going to tell you. Go, do your thing, okay? Do your thing. Now, others of you are like, "Uh, I don't know about this one. People are messy, and they get on my nerves, you know. I like the ones that don't breathe better, you know, that kind of thing. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. But you need them in your life. You need them in your life. And so my challenge to you is to go ahead and say, you know what? I- I'm going to push through. I'm going to push through the awkwardness so that I can get to the relationship. I'm going to push through all of this. Because here's the thing. Here's the thing that I know. There is going to come a point in your life When you're going to go, I wish I had a friend. I I, I wish I had a friend that I could call right now because I'm at my wit's end with my kids. I I, I wish that I had a friend right now because, you know, my, my, my husband was just diagnosed with cancer. And I wish I could have somebody to just call on and just cry with. You know, I wish I had a friend right now because, you know, um, I just lost my job. I, I wish that I had a friend. And so this, that's why my challenge to you is very, very simple today. It's this. Place yourself in a position for a relationship to help you grow your faith. That, that's it. It's pretty simple, right? You do the work of putting yourself in a position for a relationship that can alter and grow your faith. Now, if you're you're sitting out there, maybe you're watching online, even here in person, and you're like, I want to do that, but Adam, I have no idea where to start, how to even begin doing this. Well, here's what we want to do. We want to come alongside and help you. We we don't want anything from you. We want to help you, okay? we're, We're for you, and we want to help you find these relationships. This isn't about our church. This is about you. Okay? This is about you and having the right relationships in your life. And so if you want to fight the drift, but you have no clue where to start, we want to come alongside of you and help you. And so here's what I'd like to do. If that's you, if I'm describing you and you're like, I want to get in, I want to fight the drift, here's what I want you to do. I want you to text the word fight to the number 94,000, 94,000. You just text that word, fight, to 94000, and it's going to put you on just a really short form. It's just going to ask for your name and contact information, and what do you need help with? Do you want help finding a place to serve, to find a group? Or maybe there's something other, and you're just like, I I, I don't even know how to describe what it is. I just need somebody to talk with me and to help me work through this kind of stuff. Whatever it is, we're here for you. 
We want to help you do this. We know that people are lonely. And we know that we're not at our best selves whenever we're isolated. So we want to help you find yourself and place yourself into those places to where those relationships can grow and where they can foster. So text the word fight, which just means I want to fight the drift. And then fill out that short little form and let us come alongside of you and help you place yourself into the right environments so that you can develop those relationships. Because God uses our relationships with others to impact and to grow our relationship with himself. And we were created for a relationship, but we drift towards isolation. And if you want to avoid isolation, you got to fight the drift. Get busy, get in a group, and get real and share your struggles. That's what God wants for you. He wants you to be put in right relationship. And his greatest desire of all is that you would be in a right relationship with him. I mean, it's interesting as we stop and we think about, you know, just a sin and the effect of it. You know, sin being the bad things that we do, the, bad, uh, the good things that we don't do. It can be internal. It can be external. All those things. And what sin does is it creates separation. And it separates us not just from God himself, but it separates us from others. And so what God does is he uses the cross of Jesus Christ to bring about redemption, to bring about reconciliation, so that those gaps can be closed through what Jesus did. Our, the relationship with God can be dealt with. The relationship with each other can be dealt with. And that's what the cross does for us, is it brings us back into right relationship with God and with others. But maybe today, where you find yourself is just like, I... I don't even know where my relationship with God is right now. You know, maybe it's a, you know, you've never decided to follow him, or maybe you, maybe you follow, said, it, you know, you're like at a VBS, and somebody said, hey, pray this prayer kind of thing, and so you prayed a prayer, and, but that was like the end of it, or, or maybe, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but maybe you're just like, I don't even know where my faith is right now. Well, here's what God wants. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to see you restored. He wants to see you redeemed. He wants you to be free from your sins, to be free from the guilt that you're carrying around, to be free from all of your baggage. And so today, maybe you're like, that's that's what I feel like I want. That's what I need. And maybe you feel like God has just kind of like led you to this very moment. And that's why you're watching. Or maybe that's why you're here in the room. It's because he's prepared for for you this very moment. Well, if you're watching online and you want to know what it means to follow Jesus and how to do that, well, uh, just visit this website that's on the screen right here below me. Fill that out. We'll be in touch with you this week. But if you're here and you're in the room, man, what a better day than a day talking about relationships and the way that people impact our lives to say, you know what, today, God, because of the person who invited me to come, whether it was this week or all those years ago, what, what a better day to say, you know what, Jesus, I want to follow you today. And so if that's you and you're here in the room, here's what's going to happen. I'm going I'm to pray over all of this. And, and, and if you are someone who is ready to take that step and ready to put your faith in Jesus or you want to know what that looks like, maybe you're like, I, I think I'm ready to be baptized. You saw all those baptisms. You're like, I want that new life. I want to be able to see again. And then I'm, after I'm done praying, I'm going to come down here and I'm going to stand. And I would love nothing more than to be able to pray with you and to talk with you about what the Lord is doing in your life right here in this moment. So let me pray over us today. God, we thank you that you are a God of relationships and that you have orchestrated all things to bring us right here to this point and that there are many people in the background, in the story that that is told of our lives who have brought us right here into this moment. And so today, here we are and we sit and we're like, okay, today's the day. And so God, if that's uh, anybody who's online, if that's anybody who's here in the room, would you please, through the power of your Holy Spirit, would you please speak into them? And give them the courage they need to step forward and to say that they're ready to follow you. And God, others of us, as we sit and we take inventory right now, maybe right now we realize just how lonely we are because we haven't been putting ourselves into the right environments. We've been keeping people at an arm's distance. We we haven't been real. We've been putting up all kinds of fronts and fakes and walls to keep people away, putting up stop signs. Today, God, would you break through those barriers and and help us to see just the importance of having people in our lives. And then would you give us the courage to do something about it? 
God, other people here that they're like, oh man, I know people impact my relationship with God because I'm surrounded by all the wrong people. And so today, God, would you give them the wisdom to see that, but then too, give them the courage and the fortitude and the backbone to walk away from those toxic relationships, to walk away from those who are pulling them down instead of lifting them up. And then to step into relationships that are going to help them grow in their relationship with you. So God, we are asking for you to do all these things and so much more. And we trust you today. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So much for being with us today, Corinth Online. We hope it was a great day for you. We hope you were encouraged. And we hope you also were challenged when it comes to community and jumping into one, especially if you're not in one right now. We got a couple opportunities to make that happen. So one of them is corinth.cc slash decided. You can fill out any sort of decision you're working through and we will be in touch this week. And if you're looking for a community, just mark that on the form and we'll help you with that. One other opportunity for you though is next week, we have an event right here called Find My Group. And it's all for the purpose of finding a group, finding a community, resetting that rhythm of relationships. If that is an interest to you, mark that on that form and we'll get you signed up for that event next week at 1130 right here at Corinth Christian Church. Hey, remember this, no matter what, you're loved, you are valued, and we hope you have a great week. We'll see you right back here next week.